Hey everybody, what's up? It's Osiris with 15 minutes to show and we are in lovely Hotel Casa del Mar in Santa Monica. It's gorgeous out here today. I am so happy and excited. I was telling Mr. Director Stephen C. Barber, who we are have the pleasure of interviewing today, that I have an orgasmic experience when I meet people like him. And I because <laughs> that might be too much information. <laughs> and then Jimmy Chu, his dog, is here today, and we are just so happy to have you. Well, I'm, I'm very excited and, and honored that you would, of all the people in all the world, you would pick me. So. And I had to run him down. Believe me, it was not easy. Very persistent. Yes, she is. So, so Stephen, let's get right into it. One thing that I am really impressed by your work I want to know why you choose such challenging subjects like veterans and uh, that are missing in action, MIAs, and paraplegics, I think 27 of them who uh, did this race tour 567 miles or something, and you've won quite a few awards for your documentaries, and you have people like Dan Aykroyd and Ed Harris and those people narrating. What's up with that? How did you get into all of that? Well, one word, God, because I'm not this good. You know, I was really just on a real divine path. I met uh, Eddie Albert about 20 years ago. You sure you remember Eddie Albert? Of course. From uh, Green Acres fame. Of course. Eddie was in this battle called Tarawa, and it just took off from there. But it didn't take off immediately. It'd be another decade before. I mean, I never thought about making a movie, and I didn't go to film school, and I never considered making a movie. It just never even occurred to me. But 10 years later, I met another veteran who was in the same battle. And I met him serendipitously at the uh, UCLA school, uh, the book fair they have, which is now over at USC. But I saw him. He was, I like people over 90 and under six, and everybody else is suspect. So I kind of, I was, I was drawn Wait to this. Wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. I was drawn to this guy. Over 90, over 90 and, and under six. And everybody else is suspect, you know. So, so this guy was right in my demo. And we, long story short, we started talking. He was in this battle, and I, I remembered meeting Eddie like 10 years earlier and said, did you know a guy named Eddie Albert? He was a movie. He's like, I saw that son of a gun dragging bodies out of the... I'm like, how could you remember that? That was 65 years ago. He goes, how could I forget? So that's how it started. Uh, he knew Ed Harris. Uh, we went and met Ed for lunch. Ed, was, Ed just said, I'm on. We're, and that's how it started. And you know, he's seen, even across screen, and I don't know you, Mr. Harris, but even across screen, he looks very regal and very he's, like a... He's just a lovely guy, yeah, total non-movie star, just loves the work. I mean, I think if he, if he could never be interviewed, if he'd never have to do a red carpet, he wouldn't. You know, that's just not the kind of guy he is. But, he, you know, he does it because it's part of the business. So it started there. The movie took off. It and that's Return to Tarawa? Return. Is, how's it saying? Tarawa? Return to Tarawa. Yeah, and uh, the movie exploded. It was Military Channel's biggest hit at the time for the first couple of years. It was actually the very, it was right when the internet was kind of converging with, uh, with movies. And we were literally the very first movie uh, documentary that it was like, so uh, we're still on Hulu. And so that's how it started. And we got a lot of press. I was on Larry King a couple times and Good Morning America. And then, you know, then uh, the Unbeaten came up, the wheelchair movie. Yeah, the one about the paraplegics, which I find, ex good Lord. And, you know, I, I, once again, God, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, it was a guy in my uh, building who knew a guy in a wheelchair who needed help. And, and really, the, the, the thing is, everything in my life that I've done selflessly, I mean selflessly, I just... Without any intent of making money, being famous or anything, it just comes to you. I just wanted to help this guy. And so I went, and I went to J.P. DeJoy, the CEO of Paul Mitchell who's a lovely guy. I mean, he, he gives away millions and millions of dollars. And uh, I told him, I said, hey, you know, I, I know this guy in a wheelchair. He, he wants to do this crazy race. It's 267 miles in six days, 55 miles a day in wheelchairs. And he's like, how much do you need? I said, I, I don't know. I, I, he, there's three of them. He goes, well, why don't, why don't I give you 25 grand and you make me a marketing video and we'll go from there. And I went out and bought a camera. And yeah, that's how you got your first equipment. I, took, I went out and bought a camera. And looking at this phrase that I'm out fundraising for. Now, that's the hardest part. I've got five movies ready to go. It's just finding the dough. I'll leave you all my money. You can, I'll take some split with family and then leave you some and you can go ahead and do your work. Do a nice memorial for you like we did for my editor. Here, yeah. that are our audience. This is John Travis, a very, very, very well-known um, editor and one of Steven's 
from his production camp, and he just recently passed. So talk to us a little bit about him. Let's just get... He had um, narrated, I mean, he had edited a couple of our movies in the, in the past, and we brought him on for a new movie with Josh Brolin called Never Surrender. Was, that was just on the Oscar shortlist. And it was just, you know, he had a bad heart, and we didn't know, and he, he literally was working on this film 100 hours a week, and it was too much. And his heart gave, and I'm not, not that there's good news, but he, this guy ate, breathed, drank film. He died doing, literally at the Avid editing bay. He died doing what he loved. And he, you know, he died for this movie thing. And it just, uh, I was really pleased to know him. I'm glad I can just get his, keep his name going, you know. And that's a true story. People out there, you out there who know a people like John. I don't know too many people like John. Tra right now, people are pretty much all over the place. There's very few people that are living and breathing and that can say, I live, breathe, I love, absolutely love what I do. Whether I make $100 or $100 million, I love it. And his sister was Mary Travers from the legendary group Peter, Paul, and Mary. which Peter, made, Paul, and Mary. May date me, but... Oh, they, I don't care. I know Puff the Magic Dragon. Everybody knows that song. Yeah, there was... So he, he came from a pretty well-known family and he was just a really really loving decent guy and he he will be missed we miss you I didn't know you but I can feel your presence through Stephen, and you were a honey so let's get back into what we were talking about you now never surrender is this one of the films you have coming up on no, this is movie, on your plate this movie is number movie four number six whoa number six let's talk about never surrender Okay, movie number six. Which is the uh, the Ed Ramsey story. Tell the audience, you out there, a little bit about it. Well, we were out, like I said, the movies have been progressing. So we had, after Tarawa, we went out to the Philippines. We did a movie called Return of the Philippines. And then I heard about this gentleman, Ed Ramsey, who literally uh, assembled 40,000 Filipino troops to fight the Japanese. Whoa, when, when was this? 1941 to 1945. So you like historical things. Well, I can sit here and tell you that I'm, I, I'm drawn to World War II. I am now. It's just like I said, these stories just come to me. I was at a luncheon in the middle of the Philippines in Manila where I'd never been in my whole life, and this 95-year-old guy came up to me. It's always somebody in their mid-90s. He says, do you know about Ed Ramsey? <laughs> and I said, no. And then it turns out his widow lives in Santa Monica. Oh, no. Two miles from me. So I go and meet with her, and after about a year, we found the money, and we told his story, and we were up for Oscar this year, made the Oscar shortlist. You're up for the Oscar so shortlist? We get the nomination, we made the shortlist. Well, hey, making the shortlist is almost like being on the long list well, of nominees. It's just a testament to the story, and uh, now we're talking to Netflix and Hulu about buying it, and I've sold two other movies to, to Netflix and Hulu and Vudu and... Crackle and all these, you know, platforms which are great. Uh, it's, this is a fantastic time to be a filmmaker because, you know, there's just so many. You know, back 20 years ago, 50, even 10 years ago, you only, you only had cable. You only had, you know, a certain amount of platforms. Now, literally, there's hundreds and hundreds of platforms where your movie can be seen. So. And Sony has a whole. Do you? Know, Sony is running the Oscar shorts weekend. And they have ton they have a whole channel just dedicated to shorts. In my opinion, short films are the new it's the new film industry. They're easy, quick. They're long enough to grab your attention, and you can get into a story. And then short enough that you're not bored stiff in the next half an hour when the story doesn't go anywhere. I think it's the new trend, and I think you're onto something, especially with your focus and what you tend to talk about. Well, I've got stories ready to go. It's just all about fundraising. So like if uh, people are watching and they're interested in the films, you know, go to vanillafire.com. That's my shameless plug for today. That's vanillafire.com. I love the word vanilla fire. It reminds me of that movie by Tom Cruise. What was it? Vanilla something? Oh, I vanilla can't remember. Vanilla Ice. Uh, no, vanilla, vanilla Ice. something. No, vanilla Ice was a rapper. Yeah, it was. Vanilla Sky. V vanilla Sky. When I saw Vanilla, but it's always something soft and soothing about the word vanilla. But listen, do you think that your attraction to some of these stories is because you went to a military academy and he didn't forgive, forgive me you out there he didn't say he did not say that his mother Edith Wharton from New York was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize it's actually my my great aunt my mother my mother was a little to see my mother wasn't born yet but Edith Wharton yeah 1937 she won the Pulitzer she was the first woman to win the Pulitzer but more than that she slept with Hemingway Ooh, Hemingway, you dirty scoundrel. <laughs> so Sleeping with the enemies. That's her claim to fame. But, uh, 
Yeah, I, you know, I come from... So do you think some of that gives you, I think the military thing especially gives you the discipline to be able to go out and find these stories to come to you and then, of course, you having writing people, vibes around you and your background had to do something. Well, the irony is that I went to military school and I was supposed to go in the Marine Corps in 79 and I, at the last minute, decided, nah, I'm going to go to Western Kentucky University and chase women instead. Uh, but 40 you don't look like a woman chase her. Not anymore. Looks like the women chase you. I'm an uh, old man now, but <laughs> there was a day. There was a day. Um, but now I've actually reconnected with all of these guys I went to military school with. In fact, General Larry Nicholson, who's a three-star general, who's right under Mad Dog Mattis, who just became our... Mad Dog Mattis. ...became our, uh, our, uh, our Secretary of Defense, is, has become a dear friend, and he's running Okinawa now. So I pretty much have carte blanche at the at the at the Pentagon, and oh. which I've been too many times, and and I just was in Japan filming a movie in Japan, so we got to go over to Okinawa and spend time with the the general. So that's what's ironic. I still have my ring on. I have this ring on. I've had it on for. Can we get that ring? Can we get this ring on camera? Forty years. And, you see it. And I never understood why I kept it. It just there was something about it. I kept it. It's and, beautiful. It reminds me of my high school graduation. And, and but now I'm reconnected with all these folks at Augusta Military Academy. And like I said, General Nicholson has become a dear friend. And because he's such a powerful guy, this guy will probably end up being the commandant of the Marine Corps. Um, I have access to lots of places that I wouldn't have access to. Including, I think that you, who got the Congress and legislators to pass a bill making sure, making sure that the MIAs uh, that they're returned home to America. Please talk more about that. Well, what happened is the power, the power of film, the power of one DVD, a Marine saw, not this movie, but saw Return to Taro in Chicago several years ago, and he was literally pissed off. He couldn't believe that there were still 500 Marines buried on this island. So he called me, ex livid, which I thought was, and I'm a Marine, and I saw your movie, and I'm pissed. Sounds like a Marine. Nothing better than a pissed off Marine. So he ended up calling his, uh, his uh, congressman, who's a guy named uh, Dan Lipinski, he was a lovely guy. Dan wrote... Dan gets stuff done. He's a lot like you. He's relentless. And he got the legislation written. He got it passed. Uh, about a year later, I got a phone call. Hey, do you and your team want to tag along with us? We're going to go back out to Tarawa. We got a million-dollar mandate to bring some of these guys home. So my uh, partner, Matthew Housley, who's uh, an incredible director and just a... Hi, Matthew. He's been uh, with me for a decade and putting up with me. He does, he does a good job there. But he and I have really gelled as a team. Uh, I do, you know, he does a lot of the directing. I do a lot of the producing and the marketing and it's, it's worked out really well. So he and I jumped on a C-17 and went back out to Tarawa and hung out there for six weeks and watched, you know, 30 Marines dig for these, uh, 30 living Marines dig for, you know, 500 these deceased Marines. And we found two. So we found two sets of remains. And what people don't know, there's 88,000 missing from World War II. What? 88,000 never came home. There were 420. Are they just Marines or military well, in general? Mostly, well, a lot of Marines in the South Pacific because that's where most of these battles were. Most of the most of the the missing in Europe have been found, but there's still hundreds that have not have not been uh, found or, or located. But mostly in the Pacific because these battles were so intense and they were so fast. And they would have these battles and the, the, the Corps of Engineers would come and bury these men because of dysentery and what have you. And then uh, three years later they came back and they couldn't find them. You know, half the graves were because of storms. Covered over. Yeah, storms and, well, you know, just they got lost. And uh, so literally millions of family members have been waiting Seven. For, their, for their relatives and don't, they didn't know where they were. And there's no Did they even know the location of where they were or not at all? Well, you know, it was 1946. So, they, you know, it's not like they had Google Map. They didn't have ground penetrating radar. They Voice and messaging and all of that. So there's no, statute to, there's no statute of limitations on death. When you bring a set of remains home now, it is as fresh as the day that somebody died. I mean... How? What it, how can you t talk a little bit, just no, a little? It's just that these people have been waiting for their loved ones to come home. And when you get a phone call after 60 years or 70 years saying, hey, we found your Uncle Bob or we found your father, we found your brother, and we're going to bring him home. And then they have a full military funeral. Mm. I mean, it's, there's just no statute of limitations. It's just... So they are just as happy now as really, they were It's just closure. You know, it's just this, this opening, this, this, this hole. And it tears families apart. People have no idea, you know. So we made a promise to these guys when, when 
literally when any veteran or any military per personnel signs to join the service, it says in their contract that we will bring them home. We will bring them back from the battlefield. You and your people. Well, I mean, the United States government will Oh, I see. And the United States government is supporting you, which is, thank you, U.S. Well, not as much as we like. would like. You would like. But there is, they do have an organization called JPAC, which is the Joint POW-MIA Accounting Command. They're out in Hawaii, out in Hickam Air Force Base. Uh, they bring home, you know, 100 people a year, which is really lame. Um, they should be bringing home 1,000 people a year. But they're extremely underfunded. They're extremely undermanned. And they're extremely apathetic, and I'll just say that because that is what it is. It is what it is, and that's the truth coming from our director, producer, Steven, and writer, Steven C. Barber. Steven, we got to go. You know, we had 15 minutes, and it's been wonderful. So we need to know what are your future projects? What can, can we expect for you soon? What can I rush home, get the nearest? Where can we find out more about what you're doing? And how can we as fans keep up with you and what you're doing? Well, once again, VanillaFire.com is a pretty easy to... Are you on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat? Uh, yeah. You know, I'm 55. now. I know I look 54. But you look, I think, come on now, Steven, you look cute. My You're good looking. Friday, I'll be 56. Oh, wow. that's a future happy I'm birthday. I'm solicited, too. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't, you know, I'm just really not a social, I, I do Facebook. Uh, I don't do Instagram. I don't do Snapchat. I'm just, you know, I, I still write with a pencil. Kind of, kind of. So basically, we can reach Steven on his Vanilla Fire. Absolutely. I'm easy to find. It's VanillaFire.com, not Vanilla Fire Production. VanillaFire.com. And I'm working on Ray, uh, the Ray Lewis story right now. You know, Ray Lewis uh, from uh, the Baltimore Ravens. I'm, uh, in fact, waiting for him to call me any minute to give me the go-ahead. So we're out looking for money for Ray's story, and which would be the second sports documentary I did. I did a movie called The Carrier, which was the first basketball game on the aircraft carrier, Carl Vincent, which still had a military slant to it. And I also just met the governor of Texas over the weekend. At the he Super met Bowl, the governor. Who's in a wheelchair. Of Texas. And he's... In a wheelchair. What happened to him? Uh, he was running in 1984 after a storm, and a, a tree fell on him and broke his back. It was just one of those fluke things. But he came from, you know, he could have just given up, but he didn't. And now he's the governor of the second biggest state in the country. He's amazing. When he, I mean, when he pushes that chair, he pushes that chair. It's like... It's like he's running instead of in a... So he's kind of like a modern-day Roosevelt, you know? And so I want to tell that story. So I'm talking to his people, and I, I met a, a Holocaust survivor who is 93 years old, uh, who was in seven concentration camps, and I'm talking to him about telling his story. So I, I've got plenty of stories. It's just cash bones. Films run about 200000 250000 bucks, which is not a lot of money for the quality of film we do. But, you know, we've raised $3 million, and uh, we just keep going, you know? And you keep going, and the thing is, is that I don't know about you people out there, but I will tell you, take, you can take this to note. In the future, this man, this kind of director, Stephen C. Barber, documentary, short films, will be the trend of the future. You can mark my word. You can you. mark my word. People don't have the attention span anymore like they used to, and they love. And then that's Jimmy Chu, <laughs> our baby on camera, giving the, he said, that's right, Osiris, Jimmy's, that's right, you tell him. Jimmy's got his own, Jimmy has his own IMDb page. He's, he's, he's been on TV. Jimmy Chu, C-H-E-W, not C-H-O-O. -O. He's completely underwhelmed, yes. So, Stephen, yes. it's been wonderful. You're Thank awesome. you for being on Thank our 15... Thank you so much. I don't do a hug. Oh, she does hugs. Yeah. I wow. love hugging. Thank you for being on the show, everybody. Don't forget Stephen C. Barber, director, writer, producer. You'll be hearing VanillaFire.com. VanillaFire.com. You'll be hearing more from him. And don't forget <laughs> me, 15 Minutes, the show on YouTube. Also, Ankh Entertainment onenet You know you want to subscribe, so do it. Talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Peace out. Bye. Bye.